and welcome back to Tyranny. I believe it's time we meet with Blade and Mark. Blade and Mark? Why can I not remember his name? Blade and Mark, yes. Great. Before we meet with Tunon. And hopefully today is the day when we will gain the only rule over tears. A shadow steps toward you. The edges take form and substance, a familiar arrival. But rather than greeting you, the Archon slowly circles around, examining you with a discerning eye. Finally, he nods and stops before you, offering you one of his signature blades. Think you've earned me as your blade? <laughs> I can see that you've defeated the Archons of War and Secrets. No easy feat. But are you ready to stand against the Adjudicator? The Overlord. Take the dagger. With a soft hiss, wispy tendrils unfurl from the curved blade. They bite at you, swiftly slicing a sharp mark as the dagger dissolves into the palm of your hand. You know what we need to do next. Blade and Mark bows, dark arms sweeping wide like the shadows around him. His voice fades with his semblance as he seeps once more into the pitch of nothingness. You'll next see me with the Adjudicator. Be ready to wield your blade. You want to say something? The dark... Uh, yes. Alpha! To kills and shadow smells good. Mm. Alpha to kills and shadow slayed this favorite called Craven Ash. Was best death. But Beast Woman would have liked to rend muscle from bone, rip torn skin, mold and mangled more. Uh, not much, just some more. The Beast Woman sighs, languishing at the foot. Mm. Wanted to lap last drips of blood, swallow final cries of dying whimper. Wanted to watch die. More than five times over. Fate binder wants beast woman? I know. I understand you wanted to see him suffer more, but... It's not the suffering we are looking for. For today, we bring unity. We bring tears under one. Anything for Alpha to kill some shadow. Fatebinder, thank you for answering my summons. This could very well be the defining hour of the conquest. The pleasure is mine, your honor. Your manners do you well. All the same, we are here for justice, not pleasantries. I first want to make it clear why we've assembled today. After the collapse of Vendrian's Well and the start of the Civil War, it became clear to me that there must have been some great fault on the part of the Archons. We come together to root out the source of our troubles, and determine which of the Archons has sown more chaos during the war. 
I can point the culprit and spare us the discussion. Blood mulch ains the tip of a crude dagger at your heart. This is the scum who brought down the voices. I hope it isn't your intention to arm yourself before a court of peaceful legal representatives, Commander. Unless the uh, to offer amusement as Blade and Mark flays you for a delight. Kalio offers an encouraging smile. He squints at Kalio and slowly returns his weapon to its sheath. Tunon turns to aim what you can only assume is a stern look. He refocuses back onto you with cool stoicism. Much has happened since I dispatched you on that mission. Graven Ash and the voices of Narat, the appointed generals of this war, are both dead. You were instructed with bringing justice to the unlawful, but you have clearly taken the law into your own hands. Tunon hovers in thoughtful, accusatory silence. I acted on the Overlord's admonition that only one Archon would rule the tears. Do not attempt to lay responsibility for a treason at the Overlord's feet. One does not establish rule through turning cold and committing murder. No one epitomizes enlightenment rule like the voice of Nerat. Blood mode blinks at you and glances up to Tunon. Not that is the disparage the Archon of Justice. And you would be that self-appointed ruler. This court wonders what blood sacrifices your ambition will demand of you next. The court has a serious problem to address. Your conduct throughout this campaign has come into question, and you will answer for your actions. You have made quite a name for yourself, Fatebinder. Stories of your deeds have spread through the tears, and all of them have reached this court. Some actions have consequences. We will see what your actions have wrought. The chaos you've sown everywhere is unacceptable. You cast yourself so far outside the established order, I cannot begin to catalog your misdeeds. For this, you have been deemed guilty and must be executed. Am I not allowed to have a trial? Is that not the proper procedure? The outcome is a foregone conclusion, Fatebinder. Your actions cannot be allowed to stand. But if you wish to make a mockery of this court, I will add it to your list of offenses. I want to defend my actions. Very well. If you insist we proceed, then we shall. You are on trial for transgressing on the Overlord's authority, breaking the laws of the Empire, bringing mayhem to an otherwise orderly conquest, and meddling in concerns that fell beyond your station. Our directive to bring Kairos's peace to the tears has suffered, and you will answer for the part you played. If you don't mind, Adjudicator, we are on familiar terms with the Fatebinder here. Should any... Inconsistencies require our input. We will add our voices as testimony. She nods to Rogalus and then turns to you with an unreadable expression. The court has inquiries into your conduct. I first call your travel companions to speak on your behalf as witnesses to your character or accomplices to your crimes. Who will speak on behalf of the Fatebinder? Siren, Archon of Song. Give us your full report. Of course, Your Honor. Your respect for a fellow Archon is duly noted. I thank you for asking me to add my input in this very delicate matter. I will endeavor to speak honestly and stick to the heart of the matter. She makes a small curtsy and looks over at you. After a lifetime of being degraded and humiliated for the amusement of others, the Fatebinder took an injured young woman and treated her as an equal. Her behavior is beyond reproach. There is no equal in my eyes. Will anyone else speak on the Fatebinder's behalf? Scarlet Fury, you who sacrificed your old life for this one, step forward. Me? 
As if the likes of me has any business speaking in a grand hall before the Archon. Why, I've murdered enough folk to stack their bodies up to the podium ten times over. Your Honor, the Fatebinder and I get along like a couple of cats. We scratch here and there, but there's respect to be had. Sometimes I think we agree on too much, but eh, can't fight everyone. I suppose I've had worse bosses, and I suppose I've had better friends. But this one's something special. I've killed for her, and I'd do it again. Will anyone else speak on the Fatebinder's behalf? Let the Beast Woman come forward and offer testimony. I would hear her speak. Archon barks orders at Beast Woman? Thinks kids in Shadow will obey? She cocks her head to one side and stares at the Archon for a long moment. Her lips twisted with barely contained violence. Then, for peeved half, she lopes forward. Beast Woman follows only toughest, most vicious Alpha. She puffs out her bare chest, proud and flaunting. Alpha to kills in shadow has slain and rip slaughtered ruthlessly, leaving trail of price corpses through all of Tears lands. His best fighter can make even ironclads flee, yelping in fear. Will not find better predator elsewhere. Will anyone else speak on the Fatebinder's behalf? Evidently not. The time has come for the Fatebinder to offer her testimony. You are tasked with bringing order to the conquest of the Tears, and yet you ignored your directive from the Archons. Do you hold the conquest itself in contempt, or did none of the ruling factions convince you to their worth? Though Tunan maintains a stoic exterior, something about the incline of his head speaks of rage, restraint, and, perhaps more importantly, curiosity. The Archons were petty, incompetent. They didn't deserve my help. I'm afraid I must agree, Adjudicator. The account of Ash and Voices' conduct during the Siege of Vengeance Well is troubling, as you yourself agreed. Dunan weighs the matter while studying you in silence. Lithian's Crossing is either my protection, and yet you stole the Mage Bane Helm. Without the arcane protection that I commissioned from the Fortbound, the city is laid before the Bane like an offering. Why did you steal it? To be fair, a Fatebinder is tasked with using the tools at their disposal to resolve vital problems, and the Mage Bane is nothing if not a tool. Perhaps Zedania would have been better served crafting a statue, but I will allow the defendant to explain. Hmm. Definitely the first one. I couldn't allow the Bane to impede my efforts to restore order. The helmet will be returned. You speak with reason rather than greed. I don't know why I trusted trust's testimony, but I sense no falsehood. Very well. You resolved Kairos's edict of storms with legal contrivance. What's more, you spared Star Wars ruling bloodline, circumventing the edict's very purpose. Did you think the Overlord's fury was a riddle for you to unravel? Kairos didn't intend for the Edict to last forever. No, indeed, but there were conditions to be met, and you cheated them. You subverted the Overlord's will to suit your design. That cannot be tolerated. You entered the old walls, a clear violation of Kairos' law. How do you answer for this perversion of justice? Do you think yourself above the law? Oh, sorry, I tried to read the last one. <laughs> 
Very interesting. Does Archon's privilege not grant an Archon the right to administrate their domain as they see fit? Do not my spires rise from the old walls? Do not my senses flow through them? The adjudicator's head declines slightly as he listens. A long moment of silence falls. An interesting premise, albeit one that assumes a great deal about your station and the spires. At the city of Halfgate, you killed the garrison horsemen who lawfully claimed it. A dozen of Kairos' servants bloodied the streets in your wake. They attacked me and hence violated Kairos' peace. I defended myself appropriately. The adjudicator nods. I suspected as much. A pity you could not do so without eradicating our presence in the town. Ever since you arrived at the tears, you have proven stubbornly titled. Your speech is often stilled as if by some great terror or apprehension. Can you even answer for this anomaly, or are you too simple to manage it? In my dispensation of justice, I find it most useful to let others do the talking, while I observe and allow them to incriminate themselves. That is... a better justification than I had suspected. Thank you for satisfying my curiosity. I have one final question, Fatebinder. You were brought to this campaign to adjudicate the disagreements between the two armies. After your arrival, matters quickly escalated into a civil war. Did you knowingly join the conquest of the tears to sow discord in your wake, or were you merely a victim of circumstance? Hmm. I recognize the Archon's corruption from the start. It was only a matter of time before they turned on each other, and I was prepared for that eventuality. If you anticipated a failure on this scale, you should have informed me, or else work to avoid it rather than pit combatants against each other. I am finished with my line of questioning. Have you any closing remarks for the court? Though I have ever strived to bring peace and order to this shattered region, I recognize that our work is an uphill battle, and well worth the struggle. The way you frame it, the conquest sounds like a matter of true personal investment. Most curious. After weighing the charges, this court finds you guilty of all charges. It is this court's opinion that you are a seditious mastermind, a scheming derelict, and a traitor bent on sowing the destruction of the Northern Empire. The sentence is death. You nearly had me convinced that you were the right and lawful power, worthy of governing this realm, or even the Empire itself. I cannot accept that possibility, no matter how distant. You've proven yourself an incredible force, a just one, even. I have to destroy you for it. Everything you represent endangers what we've built. The Empire herself trembles in your passing. We shall see about that, Adjudicator. Or, actually... I proved myself innocent of the charges of which you precondemned me. You do not deserve to adjudicate in this court. How we feel is irrelevant, Fatebinder. Justice and law cannot be at odds with each other. With your words today, you have proven that the law is fallible, and for that you must pay. We shall see about that, Adjudicator. Hubris in the face of annihilation. 
My court and the world at large are better rid of you, wretched thing. Blood and Mark, execute her. Blood and Mark, not Blade and Mark, okay. Shadows pull and merge briskly together. Long wisps like blades billow, twist and snap as Blood and Mark emerges from the coalescing darkness. Against the expectations of the room, his deadly focus falls not to you, but to Tuman. Forgive me, Adjudicator, but this dagger now cuts for another Archon. I'm going to slice you from throat to thigh and bleed your insides out, but I'll make it quick. Carve quick, quick, deep to make prey scream. Beast woman will help human who is Shadow Hunter, who is like tribe. She bobs up and down in her excitement, and the shadows in the room draw close to her as if to kiss her hands and haunches, ready to ride her as she strikes. The Archon of Justice flows with utter equipoise, an iron grace, stolid and unmoving in the face of Blood and Mark's attack. A myriad of shadow doubles converge on the Archon, darting, slicing and scouring with tripping black blades as deadly as they are immaterial. But the Adjudicator makes no move to dodge. Instead, he merely snatches one by the throat and lifts it high before him. The shadow immediately begins to seep and dissolve into nothingness, slipping with a hiss through black-gloved fingers, but before it can escape, the adjudicator slams the haft of his gavel against the ground, rocking the court with a struggling shockwave of raw power. A blindingly white light flares from the head of the, of the gavel, and the wisping, rushing shadow into those crisp snaps harshly into the very solid form of Bedden's mark, sneering with pain as every last shadow in the room burns hotly away. A cur, believing he has severed his leash, would bite at his own master's hand. I see I must bring you to heal, yet again. I removed the binding of shadows. You have no hold on me. Adjudicator, who taught you? He chokes and rises against Tuna's grip. But every dagger he draws dissipates in the harsh glare of light. His skin burns and his clothes smoke, and finally, a jagged cry escapes his throat. Did you think the Overlord favored you because she spared you once? Did you believe that she would one day allow you to defeat me? That she would entrust you to me with no sound means for discipline? <sighs> Sorry, kid. <laughs> Can't help you after all. Don't worry, I won't die. His eyes widen as the light bursts through him in several places, disintegrating whole chunks of his body. Be gone, and reflect upon the consequence of your choices, Archon of Shadows. Suffer in a state of endless illumination until I deem you have corrected your misbehavior. Be gone, Archon of Shadows. You bring disgrace to your very station. To find such impertinence in my very court, all will be punished in due time. You, Fatebinder, will be the first. Even behind Tunun's mask of resolve, you know that behind it lies a man of trembling anger. He slams his staff to the ground. Oh, hi. First things first, I need to move away. Out, you little shit. I wonder if they would help him if I didn't. Hunt them on my side. Damn, Boulder, go! Sharpest claws! 
should not personally do anything. Will do. Oh, we want it. Stop dodging strike from rending claws! Nobody heard that, right? <laughs> You, you have learned much in your few years, Archon. Striking down our kind is more than the swinging of a blade or pounding of a mallet. There are Kairos's laws, and the laws that govern our natural order. I fear they often diverge. I have broken the laws of nature for too long. Life should end in its course. And this is my time at last. For the pain, you can hear something like a satisfaction in Tunon's words. Kairos is coming. An army swifter and more dangerous than Disfavored and Scarlet Chorus combined makes for the tears, propelled by the Overlord's will. Your efforts here are wasted. You cannot halt this advance. Can't I? An edict issued upon the Northern Empire should do the trick. Perhaps I underestimated you. You... you wield the talents of the Overlord. Better that you use them to end your life, because Kairos will dismantle everything you attempt to build. Good luck. Tunun raises his arms up high and looks at the ceiling of his court. With a flash of arcane power, the Archon is no more. That chorus justice for you. No matter how tall you may stand, someone below is eager to watch you fall. It's not so tough. Like all creatures grow weak from too many seasons. Was Prima's favorite for too long. Became rated with too much arrogance. This is incredible, Fatebinder. We just destroyed Kairos' personal judge and executioner. If there was any doubt of your power, it is gone now. Face of judgment. And rule of law. Let's level you up. I don't know how much we have left, if we really... will go... Come on. through with defending against the Kairos themselves. Or... this is where it ends. I don't know. So, I think we'll play a little bit longer today. Heavy clouds loom overhead and a mist-like rain drizzles down, covering your cloak in a spiderweb of beaded droplets. The water clings to Siren's helm like a veneer of a diamond, somehow catching and reflecting light in the gloom. The Argon of Song treads the damp road with chin raised, imperiously scowling down her nose at the weather. Just off the road ahead you spy a gathering of tents and canopies, a small settlement of I the Initarent. Bearing no banners or heraldry, Siren poses, the specter of a grin tagging at the corners of her mouth. I would hardly want to ruin the surprise fate by there. Okay, let's see the camp. The tearsmen have cleared the tall grass from small areas to either side of the road. While there are few true tents, most of the shelters are large canvas tarps suspended from poles or tied off to the trees. Bedrolls litter the damp ground, though a few of the larger canopies boast a hammock or two. Men and women in rough span tunics and woolen cloaks cluster around fires, seeking, seeking warmth against the weather. Few look up at your arrival, though those who do immediately come to their feet. Akan, one gasps. Goodness. Uh, let's pay them. 
You untie several rings from your belt and toss them among the peasants. You are surprised when they don't immediately grasp for them. All around you, tearsmen rise to their feet. Their murmuring rises, a quiet curse. Almost as one, the peasants drop to their knees in the wet grass, bowing low and chanting a single name. Sirin. Sirin smiles so sweetly, it's suckering. My adoring public. She gestures to the gathered throng. They seem to be peasants paying proper respect to their betters. I understand why you would fail to recognize such a thing. She huffs when you demand further explanation. <laughs> when I abandoned Livia Crossing, I left those wonder wondrous folk behind. It seems they've come looking for me. Deal with them. The Archon's voice rises and the air seems to lighten, its weight lifting from your back. Their eyes widening, the tears when fall to their knees, attention entirely wrapped. A soft forkiness settles in your mind. Siren turns to you, her large blue eyes filling your vision. Are you sure I can't keep them? Send them to the citadel then. Fine! The word cuts through the warmth in your mind like a chilled sickle, and for a moment, the eyes of the peasants narrow upon you. Then Siren's song continues. The tearsman features go slack, and the Archon of Songs direct them toward their new destination. There! She hisses. Done! You continue on your journey. I do not understand her humors. I really don't. I wonder if this is how, how Kairos does it using the spire. The waves of energy radiating from the spire draw you forward, pressing your body and mind to its eager embrace. At the center of its tide, the resonator stands ready to broadcast your voice, echoing your commandments to the farthest reaches of the tears and beyond. From here, the highest point of in all the peninsula, you could, with the sum total of your efforts, project your will far north past the edge of the tears, and proclaim your edict as far as the lands of the Northern Empire. This probably amounts to a declaration of war against the Overlord. Ready? So this is it. <laughs> We've come a long way since entering ruins. I never... Before this, I was nothing important. One Scarlet Chorus Killer among thousands, but we're really, really doing something here. Thanks for letting me tag along. She turns to the edge of the spire, avoiding your gaze. Beast woman and elf of the kills in shadow have slaughtered many tough challenges and fight for survival. Have hunted archons and rip ravaged whole armies. If Kairos was in tears lands, Shadow Hunter would tear out human Prima's throat, consume fear flooded heart and sent mark humans mangled bones. Alpha 2 would do the same. It's beginning of new season, of time to hunt human called Overlord. The last surviving shadow hunter hunters on all fours, her back arched, head thrown back to the firmament as she howls loud enough to shake the tears. It's incredible what you've done to get here. I think you can take it another step further, and I want to be at your side when it happens. You were the first one who didn't twist me to suit your ends, and I'll never forget this. So let's finish what we started. If I don't show Kairos my ability to cast the edict is more than one more f time thing, the attacks will never stop. Striking the overlord where it hurts, good. I hope the old codpiece feels it from his throne room. Take your best swing. She nods to the resonator at the center of the spire. The spire awaits your command. The Edict of Nightfall brings permanent darkness to the land. Plants will wither, 
animals were sicken, and people would slowly freeze without the sun's warmth. I wonder how we get those two edicts. Darkness plagues the region, regardless of the time of day. The party gains a bonus to subterfuge and damage, while foes receive a penalty to perception range and accuracy. Foes are also blinded at the start of combat. The tears have been conquered, unified at last under a single banner. Your edict brings devastation and ruin to the Northern Empire. Some believe the edict to be Kairos's work. Others hope or fear that this edict comes from a new voice. Kairos' forces withdraw from their march upon the Tears, as they are sent into disarray by your edict. With none left in the Tears to challenge your claim, you fortify your grasp on the war-torn realm. The Overlord's conquest of the known world has come to a halt and the whisper of a challenger to Kairos's power slowly spreads throughout the land. Your edict of nightfall shrouds the northern capital in unending darkness. While some remain in their homes and beg Kairos for salvation, those less hopeful make for brighter parts of the empire seeking the warmth of the sun and wondering how it was that the Overlord could not protect them. As chaos endured in the Northern Kingdom, the armies marching on the tears received an unprecedented order. The armies were to fall back to the capital and ensure the safety of its people from the Edict. For the first time in Kairos' great conquest, the armies retreated. Soon questions would be asked in a hushed, breath across the lands about what new and terrible power had emerged that could force the hand of their overlord. You fulfilled Kairos' decree and all the tears is now ruled by a single Archon. Your former rivals have either submitted to you or perished, bringing the civil war to a close. Neither of the Archons charged with conquering the tears impressed you enough to follow their lead. You ultimately defied your orders, seeking a better way to gain control. Eliminating every Archon who dared stand in your way, you carved your own seat of power in the tears, keeping yourself independent from the Northern Empire. In their pride, the disfavored never imagined themselves beaten, especially when their opponents appeared so disorganized. The last remnants of the Legion disperse, their general destroyed, their honor broken beyond mending. The scorn that follows their humbled ranks haunts them even in the depths of obscurity. The Scarlet Chorus may have been mighty in numbers, but that didn't stop you from thoroughly scattering them, cutting off the serpent's head and sending each of the gangs howling back to the chaos they sowed. How the remnants of the Horde occupy themselves without a war to fight becomes a topic for nightmares. Word of your success spreads beyond the tears as well. Even the most distant corners of the Empire whisper of the Fatebinder who rose to become an Archon and an Archon whose intervention shattered the conquest, making way for a new future in the devastated nation. Without the authority of Karas' Archons to enforce the Overlord's vision on the world, the fall of the conquest becomes a great revolution. Roaring faction, frac Warring factions struggle for dominance and infighting is a fact of daily life. Every group insists the situation is an opportunity for the tears to rebuild as they see fit. The Edict of Stone continues to ravage the Stone Sea, 
sapping the land of arcane power and shifting the terrain at increasingly treacherous angles. Any evidence of the former realm of Azure vanishes over time, until all that survives is a memory. Cairn, left to suffer in his half-dead state, continues to cause earthquakes throughout the Stone Sea, eventually leading the remaining humans to leave as the area becomes more unstable. By letting the Edict of Stone persist, you allow the Stone Stalkers to develop a nation of their own, where beastmen are free to grow their culture away from human habitation. The tribe expands by welcoming the strong and expelling the weak, grooming the rags for a prosperous tomorrow. The Stone Stalkers grow in power, using the magic infused crystals to cure their spells. So it could break the, this Edict of Stone? I did, honestly, I didn't see any way of doing that. The death of the Radix is a huge blow to the disfavored. Without the support of the Mage Guild, the Legion finds itself outclassed for the first time and suffers on the battlefield. Soon after the death of the Archon, the garrison deserted the crumbling fortress of Sentinel Stand. With the unbroken, all but destroyed, the former citizens of Stalwart slide into lawlessness and begin to fight over what little they can salvage. To save her child, Amelia abdicated her claim to the throne of Stalwart. Lacking allies or a mission beyond survival, she bundles her baby close and sets out to find a safer, less warlike frontier in modest anonymity. If the need arises, she is ready to protect the precious burden with her life. Though it takes time to recover from the devastation of the Edict of Storms, the Blade Grave begins its slow march toward healing. The realm of Stalwart may never resemble its former glory, but the land is not so blasted that something new and better can't be built atop the bones of the past. The region bloodline has ended. With it, new traditions and legacies spring to life. You eliminated the scarlet chorus that plagued the disfavored troops in the Velum Citadel, cutting a path through them all the way to the Silent Archive. Instead of destroying it as Graven Ash wanted, you chose to keep it for yourself, realizing the knowledge contained in the scroll was far more useful in your hands. By taking the Silent Archive from its pedestal and disrupting the preservation spell holding Velum Citadel in stasis, you caused the collapse of the single largest repository of knowledge in Teratus. The world may never know the true extent of the loss. The sages are all but wiped from the tears. What remains of their hoarded knowledge is vulnerable, as likely to be misused as destroyed. The damage done to the intellectual core of the region is likely beyond reversal. Though small groups of would-be scholars gain influence from time to time, the setback is ultimately too vast to overcome. By withholding the Mage Bane Helm from Lithian's Crossing, you sabotage the city's protection against Bane haunting its borders from inside the old walls. Sensing the vulnerability in its defenses, an unstoppable wave of Bane invaded Lithian's Crossing, wreaking havoc and causing the catastrophic loss of life. The few wrecked survivors abandoned the city to the Scourges, never to return. You allowed the Forgebound Master to live as her life held no bearing on your greater schemes. With Ash dead and disfavored floundering, the Forgebound also fail, having lost their main source of work. Eventually, their numbers dwindle to a handful of skilled court workers who only take commissions from the very wealthy. Reef Talon's attempts to play dotting mother to the wound community prove ineffectual. She tries to establish a sense of discipline and hard work, but her self-doubt sabotages her methods. She never overcomes her, the suspicions of the rest of the wound. As wound denizens abandon their patrols or listlessly perform chores, life in the settlement deteriorates, bane attacks become more common, and people begin to live. Jaspers and Woks have finally found common cause, critiquing Rift Talon's leadership. Far from uniting, uniting them, However, it only further polarizes the settlement, each of the majors moving once again to solidify, solidify a base of power from which to claim authority. 
By enacting an edict of vengeance well, you announced your power to the world and showed Kairos' forces what you were capable of. When you defeated their leader and scattered the army before you, it sent a message to Kairos. A new Archon is born. While the edict dissipated, its effects will always be felt as the first true threat to Kairos' rule. The death of Graven Ash means the end of the disfavored. Without the comfort and support of the great general, what remains of the legion sinks into hopelessness. The Archon seat is left vacant, and whether or not it can be occupied again is a heated topic. Far from his place of final rest, the Northern Empire mourns its fallen son. Killing the voices of Nerat spreads the joy of bloody vengeance across the continent. Celebrated as the death of history's greatest parasite, the occasion is marked by all who suffered under the oppression of the Scarlet Chorus. Even in victory, one fought nags you. Though you witness his death, you can't help but wonder if the voices of Nerat is done with you. With the death of Tunon the Adjudicator, the bastard city threatens to slide back into its lawless ways. Keeping the peace and imposing a new definition of order commands all of your focus. You learn to delegate the responsibilities to a new court of paidbinders, who lighten the burden and make the Archon's absence a manageable setback. The fealty of a killer like Blade and Mark leaves you constantly glancing over your shoulder. You gain a measure of comfort by retaining his skills as a headsman, keeping him busy with assignments that take him far from your seat of power. As the spans pass, you come to rely on his knack for rooting out agents of your enemies and sleep easier under his watchful protection. The death of Graven Ash left Barrick a shadow of his former self. He follows you for a time, as much out of habit as reflex. All agree that there is nothing of him left under the iron shell. He departs your company without a word, assuming a position at a crossroads where he allows himself to rust as solid as any statue. In the absence of the voices of Nerat and the need of to avenge her fallen sister, Varys discovers something akin to contentment. For a time, you find her high atop your spire, face turned towards the horizon with eyes closed against the wind that ruffles the feathers in her hair. It doesn't last. Varys disappears from your service without a farewell. When she returns months later, she is trailed by a disparate gang of young women recruited from every corner of the tears. For farmers, merchants and former nobles hungry for greatness, all pledged to study the bloody lessons verse has to impart. Her new callous sisterhood grows slowly compared to the chorus, but each member makes of violence a mesmerizing dance. Soon verse and her cadre become the most feared of your enforcers achieving a notoriety almost akin to that of Blade and Marks. Lantry keeps a close watch over you, scribbling his accounts of your deeds and accomplishments. In his tireless quest to fill the chronicle with history and knowledge, he follows you even into his twilight years and together you learn much about the world. You pretend not to notice Lantry's waning strength. Do you find yourself pausing mid-sentence to let him writing catch up? He recognizes your generous ruse and appreciates it in silence. Ebb remains in your company, where she seeks out promising recruits among your supporters. After recognizing some obvious talents, she takes on a team of apprentices in a new school of would-be tightcasters. Though she often jokes that the school is bound to fail with her heart at the helm, her students think otherwise, as do the many dozens of hopefuls who come begging for her tutelage. Kills in Shadows shows little interest in cleaning up the tears after your victory. Instead, she takes it upon herself to hunt down every disfavored soldier in the country. You hear frequent word of maulings and disappearances among Kairos' ranks, perpetuated by a beast of legendary ferocity. Though you could no doubt track down your wayward companion, you let her continue the bloody work out of equal parts respect and fear. Without the threat of the overlord's control, Syrian struggles with how to manage her freedom. 
Inspiration finally strikes her and she travels the tears, visiting the small villages ravaged, ravaged by Karos's occupation. She sings to the frightened and hard villagers, wooing their spirits and allaying their fears. Guilt for her hand in the horrors wrought upon the world by the scarlet course spur her on the, and her wonders become more and more spectacular. The followers of the songbird grow in number, taking the message of peace and harmony throughout Teratus. By abandoning your decorated career in Kairos' military, you gave the tears room to define the path ahead. The future will not be mapped by foreign ideals or the will of a distant autocrat. It is only a matter of time before the Overlord launches a retaliation. You will be ready to face it. Without allies, the winds are especially cold atop your spire. You await Kairos' inevitable advance. Brooding over the decisions that led you to this point, though the tears are friendless, Endless place, they are indisputably your new home. And that concludes the tyranny. I must admit, I curse, cast the curse upon the people who told that this game lasts 10 hours and is too short for proper RPG. That was definitely not 10 hours, but it was amazing. Even though that little bug that made us uh, betray Graven Ash. But nonetheless, it aligned with my plan, so it wasn't that big of a deal. So, thank you very much. Stay alive and see you soon. Bye.